Hello, my darling, and welcome to today's story time. Today we are reading Jack the Giant Killer. It is an English folktale. It's been attributed to multiple authors, but is found in the series called English Fairy Tales by Flora Annie Steele, published in 1918. I have a nice fire crackling in the background for you to help you fall asleep. And now, on with our story time. When good King Arthur reigned with Guinevere, his queen, there lived, near the land's end in Cornwall, a farmer who had only one son, called Jack. Now, Jack was brisk and ready, and of such a lively wit that none nor nothing could worst him. In those days, the Mount of St. Michael in Cornwall was the fastest of a huge giant whose name was Cormoran. He was full eighteen feet in height, some three yards about his middle, a grim, fierce face, and he was the terror of all the countryside. He lived in a cave amidst the rocky mount, and when he desired victuals, he would wade across the tides to the mainland and furnish himself forth with all that came in his way. The poor folk and the rich folk alike ran out of their houses and hid themselves when they heard the swish, swash of his big feet in the water. For if he saw them, he would think nothing of broiling half a dozen or so of them for breakfast. As it was, he seized their cattle by the score, carrying off half a dozen fat oxen on his back at once, and hanging sheep and pigs to his waist belt like bunches of dip candles. Now this had gone on for long years, and the poor folk of Cornwall were in despair, for none had put an end to the giant, Cormoran. It so happened that one market day, Jack, then, quite a young lad, found the town upside down over some new exploit of the giants. Women were weeping, men were cursing, and the magistrates were sitting in council over what was to be done. But none could suggest a plan. Then Jack, lithe and happy, went up to the magistrates, and with a fine curtsy, for he was ever polite, Asked them what reward would be given to him who killed the giant, Cormoran. The treasures of the giant's cove, quoth they. Every whit of it, quoth Jack, it was never to be done. To the last farthing, quoth they. Then I will undertake the task, said Jack, and forthwith set about the business. It was winter time. And having got himself a horn, a pickaxe, and a shovel, he went over to the mount in the dark evening, set to work, and before dawn he had dug a pit, no less than twenty-two feet deep, and nigh as big across. This he covered with long, thin sticks and straw, sprinkling a little loose mold over all of it to make it look like a solid ground. So... Just as dawn was breaking, he planted himself fair and square on the side of the pit that was farthest from the giant's cave, raised the horn to his lips, and with a full blast sounded. Tentivy, tentivy, tentivy. Just as he would have done had he been hunting a fox. Of course, this woke the giant who rushed in a rage out of his cave. And seeing little Jack, bare and square, blowing away at his horn, as calm and cool as may be, he became still more angry. He made for the disturber of his rest, bawling out, I'll teach you to wake a giant, you little whippersnapper. You shall pay dearly for your tantivies. I'll take you and broil you for breakfast. 
He'd only gotten as far as this one crash. He fell into the pit. So there was a brick, indeed, such as one that had caused the very foundations of the mount to shake. But Jack shook with laughter. Oh, ho, he cried. How about breakfast now, sir giant? Will you have me broiled or baked? And will no diet serve you? But poor little Jack. Faith, I've got you in loaves pound now. You're in the stocks for bad behavior. And I'll plague you as I like. What I had brought in eggs. But this will do as well. And with that, he held up with his pickaxe and dealt the giant cormoran such a most weighty knock on the very crown of his head that he killed him on the spot. Whereupon Jack calmly filled up the pit with earth again and went to search the cave where he found much treasure. Now, when the magistrates heard of Jack's great exploit, they proclaimed that henceforth he should be known as Jack, the giant killer. They presented him with a sword and belt, on which these words were embroidered in gold. He is the valiant Cornishman who slew the giant, Cormoran. Of course, the news of Jack's victory soon spread all over England, so that another giant named Blunderbore, who lived to the north, hearing of it, vowed if he ever came across Jack, he would be revenged upon him. Now this giant Blunderbore was lord of an enchanted castle that stood in the middle of a lonesome forest. It so happened that Jack, about four months after he killed Cormoran, had occasion to journey into Wales, and on the road he passed this forest. Weary with walking and finding a pleasant fountain by the wayside, he lay down to rest and was soon fast asleep. Now the giant Blunderbore, coming to the well for water, found Jack sleeping, and he knew by the lines embroidered on his belt that this was the far-famed giant killer. Rejoiced at his luck, the giant, without more ado, lifted Jack onto his shoulder and began to carry him through the wood to the enchanted castle. But the rustling of the boughs awakened Jack, who, finding himself already in the clutches of the giant, was terrified. Nor was his alarm decreased by seeing the courtyard of the castle, all strewn with men's bones. Yours will be with them before long, said Blunderbore. He locked poor Jack into an immense chamber above the castle gateway. They had a high-pitched, beamed roof, and one window that looked down upon the road. Here poor Jack was to stay while Blunderbore went to fetch his brother giant, who lived in the same wood, that he might share in the feast. Now, after a time, Jack, watching through the window, saw the two giants tramping hastily down the road, eager for their dinner. Now, said Jack to himself, my death, for my deliverance is at hand. For he had thought out a plan. In one corner of the room, he had seen two strong cords. These he took, and making a cunning noose at the end of each, he hung them out of the window. And, as the giants were unlocking the iron door of the gate, managed to slip them over their heads without them noticing it. Then, quick as thought, he tied the other ends to a beam, so that as the giants moved on the nooses, they tightened and throttled them until they grew black in the face. Seeing this, Jack slid down the ropes and drawing his sword, slew them both. So, taking the keys of the castle, he unlocked all the doors and set free three beauteous ladies who, tied by the hair of their heads, he found almost starved to death. Sweet ladies, said Jack, kneeling on one knee, for he was ever polite. Here are the keys of this enchanted castle. I have destroyed the giant Blunderbore and his brutish brother, 
and thus have restored to you your liberty. These keys should bring you all else you require. So saying this, he proceeded on his journey to Wales. He traveled as fast as he could, perhaps too fast, for, losing his way, he found himself benighted and far away from any habitation. He wandered on, always in hopes, until on entering a narrow valley, he came on a very large, dreary-looking house, standing alone. Being anxious for shelter, he went up to the door and knocked. You may imagine his surprise and alarm when the summons was answered by a giant with two heads. But though this monster's look was exceedingly fierce, his manners were quite polite, the truth being that he was a Welsh giant, and as such double-faced and smooth, given to gaining his malicious ends by a show of false friendship. So he welcomed Jack heartily in a strong Welsh accent, prepared a bedroom for him, where he was left with kind wishes for a good rest. Jack, however, was too tired to sleep well, and as he lay awake, he overheard the host muttering to himself in the next room. Having very keen ears, he was able to make out these words, or something like them. They will hear you lodge with me this night. You shall not see the morning light. The club shall dash your brains outright. Sayest thou so, said Jack to himself, standing up at once. So that is your Welsh trick, is it? But I will be even with you. Then, leaving his bed, he laid a big billet of wood among the blankets, and taking one of these to keep himself warm, made himself snug in a corner of the room. He pretended to snore, so as to make Mr. Giant think he was asleep. And sure enough, after a little time, in came the monster on tiptoe, as if treading on eggs, and carrying a big club. Then, whack, whack, whack. Jack could hear the bed being belabored until the giant, thinking every bone of his guest's skin must be broken, stole out of the room again, Whereupon, Jack went calmly to bed once more, and he slept soundly. Next morning, the giant couldn't believe his eyes when he saw Jack coming down the stairs, fresh and hearty. Odd splutter her nails, he cried, astonished. Did you sleep well? Was there nothing felt in the night? No, oh, replied Jack, laughing into his sleeve. I think a rat did come in and give me two or three flaps of his tail. On this, the giant was dumbfounded and led Jack to breakfast, bringing him a bowl which held at least four gallons of hasty pudding. He bid him, as a man of such metal, to eat the lot. Now Jack, when traveling, wore under his cloak a leathern bag to carry his things withal. So, quick as thought, he hitched this round in front of him, with the opening just under his chin, and thus he ate. He could slip the best part of the pudding into it, without the giant's being any wiser. So he sat down to breakfast, the giant gobbling down his own measure of hasty pudding, while Jack made way with his. See, says crafty Jack, when he had finished, I'll show you a trick or two of yours. And with that, he up with a carving knife, and ripping up the leathern bag, out fell all the hasty pudding onto the floor. What have you done? cried the giant. You can't do that to yourself. Whereupon he seized the carving knife, and he ripped open his own belly, and fell down dead. Thus was Jack done with the Welsh giant. Now it so happened that in those days... When gallant knights were always seeking adventures, King Arthur's only son, a very valiant prince, begged of his father a large sum of money to enable him to journey to Wales, and there strive to set free a certain beautiful lady, 
was possessed by seven evil spirits. In vain the king denied him, so at last he gave way, and the prince set out with two horses, one of which he rode, the other laden with gold pieces. Now after some days' journey, the prince came to a market town in Wales, where there was a great commotion. On asking the reason for it, he was told that, according to law, the corpse of a very generous man had been arrested on its way to the grave, because in life it had owed large sums of money to the money lenders. This is a strange law, said the young prince. Go bury the dead in peace, and let the creditors come to my lodgings. I will pay the debts of the dead. So the creditors came, but they were so numerous by that evening the prince had but two pence left for himself, and could go no further on his journey. Now it so happened that Jack the Giant Killer was on his way to Wales, and he passed through the town. Hearing of the prince's plight, he was so taken with the kindness and generosity that he determined to be the prince's servant. So this was agreed upon. The next morning, after Jack had paid the reckoning with his last farthing, the two set out together. But as they were leaving the town, an old woman ran up to the prince and called out, Justice! Justice! The dead man owed me two pence these seven years. Pay me, as well as the others. And the prince, kind and generous, put his hand to his pocket and gave the old woman the two pence that was left to him. So now they had not a penny between them. And when the sun grew low, the prince said, Jack, since we have no money, how are we to get a night's lodging? And Jack replied, We shall do well enough, master, for within two or three miles of this place there lives a huge and monstrous giant with three heads, who can fight four hundred men in armor and make them fly from him like a chaff before the wind. And what good will that be to us? asked the prince. He will for sure chop us up in a mouthful. Nay, said Jack, laughing. Let me go and prepare the way for you. By all accounts, this giant is adult. Mayhap I may manage better than that. So the prince remained where he was. And Jack pricked his steed at full speed until he came to the giant's castle, at the gate of which he knocked so loud he made the neighboring hills resound. On this the giant roared from within like a voice of thunder. Who's there? Then said Jack as bold as brass. None but your poor cousin Jack. Cousin Jack, quoth the giant, astounded. And what news with my poor cousin Jack? For you see, he was quite taken aback. So Jack made haste to reassure him. Dear cousin, heavy news, good what? Heavy news, echoed the giant, half afraid. Good what? No heavy news can come to me. Have I not three heads? Have I not five hundred men in armor? Can I not make them fly like chaff before the wind? True, replied Crafty Jack. But I came to warn you, because the great King Arthur's son, with a thousand men in armor, is on his way to kill you. At this, the giant began to shiver and to shake. Ah, oh, Cousin Jack, my kind Cousin Jack, this is heavy news indeed, he said. Tell me, what am I to do? Hide yourself in the vault, says Crafty Jack, and I will lock and bolt and bar you in, and I will keep the key until the prince is gone, and you will be safe. Then the giant made haste and ran down into the vault, and Jack locked and bolted and barred him in. Then, being thus secure, he went and fetched his master and the two made themselves heartily merry over what the giant was to have for supper, while the miserable monster shivered and shook with fright 
in the underground vault. Well, after a good night's rest, Jack woke his master in the early morn, and having furnished him well with gold and silver from the giant's treasure, bade him ride three miles forward on his journey. So when Jack judged that the prince was pretty well out of the smell of the giant, he took the key and let his prisoner out. He was half dead with cold and damp, but very grateful, and he begged Jack to let him know what he would be given as a reward for saving the giant's life and castle from destruction, and he should have it. You're very welcome, said Jack, who always had his eyes about him. All I want is the old coat and cap, together with the rusty old sword and slippers, which are at your bedhead. When the giant heard this, he sighed and shook his head. You don't know what you're asking, he said. They are the most precious things that I possess. But as I have promised, you must have them. The coat will make you invisible. The cap will tell you all you want to know. The sword will cut asunder whatever you strike. And the slippers will take you wherever you want to go in the twinkling of an eye. So Jack, overjoyed, rode away with the coat and cap, the sword and slippers, and soon overtook his master. And they rode on together until they reached the castle, where the beautiful lady lived, whom the prince sought. Now she was very beautiful, for all she was possessed of seven devils. And when she heard the prince sought her as a suitor, she smiled and ordered a splendid banquet to be prepared for his reception. And she sat on his right hand and plied him with food and drink. And when the repast was over, she took out her own handkerchief, wiped her lips gently, and said with a smile, I have a task for you, my lord. You must show me that kerchief tomorrow morning or lose your head. And with that, she put the handkerchief in her bosom and said, Good night. The prince was in despair, but Jack said nothing until his master was in bed. And he put on the old cap he had gotten from the giant, and lo, in a minute he knew all that he wanted to know. So, in the dead of the night, when the beautiful lady called on one of her familiar spirits to carry her to Lucifer himself, Jack was beforehand with her, and putting on his coat of darkness and his slippers of swiftness, was there as soon as she was. And when she gave her handkerchief to the devil, bidding him keep it safe, he put it away on a high shelf. But Jack was up and nipped it away in a trice. So the next morning, when the beauteous enchanted lady looked to see the prince crestfallen, he just made a fine bow and presented her with the handkerchief. At first, she was terribly disappointed, but as the day drew on, she ordered another and still more splendid repast to be got ready. And this time, when the repast was over, she kissed the prince full on the lips and said, I have a task for you, my lover. Show me tomorrow morning the last lips I kissed tonight. Or you will lose your head. Then the prince, who by this time was head over heels in love, said tenderly, If you will kiss none but mine, I will. Now the beauteous lady, for all she was possessed by seven devils, could not but see that the prince was very handsome. So she blushed a little and said, That is neither here nor there. You must show me them or death is your portion. So the prince went to his bed, sorrowful as before. But Jack put on the cap of knowledge and knew in a minute all he wanted to know. Thus, when, in the dead of the night, the beauteous lady called on her familiar spirit to take her to Lucifer himself, Jack in his coat of darkness and his shoes of swiftness was there before her. Thou hast betrayed me once, said the beauteous lady to Lucifer, frowning, by letting go of my handkerchief. 
now will I give thee something none can steal, and so best the prince, king's son though he be. With that she kissed the loathly demon, full on the lips, and left him. Whereupon Jack, with one blow of the rusty sword of strength, cut off Lucifer's head, and, hiding it under his coat of darkness, brought it back to his master. Thus, the next morning, when the beauteous lady, with malice in her beautiful eyes, asked the prince to show her the lips she had kissed, he pulled out the demon's head by the horns. On that, the seven devils, which possessed the poor lady, gave seven dreadful shrieks and left her. Thus, the enchantment being broken, she appeared in all her perfect beauty and goodness, so she and the prince were married the very next morning. After which, they journeyed back to the court of King Arthur, where Jack the Giant Killer, for his many exploits, was made one of the knights of the round table. This, however, did not satisfy our hero, who was soon on the road again searching for giants. Now, he had not gone far when he came upon one, seated on a huge block of timber near the entrance to a dark cave. He was a most terrific giant. His goggle eyes were as coals of fire. His countenance was grim and gruesome. His cheeks, like huge flitches of bacon, were covered with stubbly beard, the bristles of which resembled rods of iron wire, while the locks of hair that fell on his brawny shoulders showed like curled snakes or hissing adders. He held a knotted iron club and breathed so heavily you could hear him a mile away. Nothing daunted by this fearsome sight, Jack alighted from his horse and putting on his coat of darkness, went close up to the giant and said, Hello, is that you? It will not be long before I have you fast by your beard. So saying, he made a cut with a sword of strength at the giant's head, but somehow, missing his aim, cut off the nose instead, clean as a whistle. My goodness, how the giant roared. It was like claps of thunder, and he began to lay about him with the knotted iron club, like one possessed. The jack in his coat of darkness easily dodged the blouse, and running in behind, drove the sword up the hilt to the giant's back, and he fell down, stone dead. Jack then cut off the head, and sent it to King Arthur by a wagoneer, whom he hired for the purpose. After which, he began to search the giant's cave to find his treasure. He passed through many windings and turnings, until he came to a huge hall, paved and roofed with freestone. At the upper end of this was an immense fireplace, where hung an iron cauldron, the like of which, for size, Jack had never seen before. It was boiling, and gave out a savory stream, while beside it, on the right hand, stood a big, massive table, set out with huge platters and mugs. Here it was, that the giants were to dine. Going a little further, he came upon a sort of window barred with iron, and looking within beheld a vast number of miserable captives. Alas, alas, they cried on seeing him, art come, young man, to join us in this dreadful prison. That depends, said Jack, but first tell me why you are thus held imprisoned. Through no fault, they cried at once. We are captives of the cruel giants and are kept here, and well nourished, and else at a time as the monsters desire a feast. Then they choose the fattest, and sup off them. On hearing this, Jack straight away unlocked the door of the prison, and set the poor fellows free. Then, searching the giant's coffers, he divided the gold and silver equally among the captives, as some redress for their sufferings. He took them to a neighboring castle and gave them a good right feast. Now, as they were all making merry over their deliverance and praising Jack's prowess, a messenger arrived 
to say that one Thunderdell, a huge giant with two heads, having heard the death of his kinsman, was on his way from the northern dales to be revenged. He was already within a mile or two of the castle. The country folk were flying before him with their flocks and herds like chaff before the wind. Now the castle with its gardens stood on a small island that was surrounded by a moat twenty feet wide, thirty feet deep, and having very steep sides. And this moat was spanned by a drawbridge. This, without a moment's delay, Jack ordered should be sawn on both sides at the middle, so as to only leave one plank uncut, over which he, in his invisible cloak of darkness, passed swiftly to meet his enemy, bearing in his hand the wonderful sword of strength. Even though the giant could not, of course, see Jack, he could smell him, for giants have keen noses. Therefore, Thunderdale cried in a voice like his name, Be by foe from. I smell the blood of an Englishman. Be he alive or be he dead. I'll grind his bones to make my bread. Is that so? said Jack, cheerful as ever. Then thou art a monstrous miller for sure. On this, the giant, peering round everywhere for a glimpse of his foe, shouted out, Art thou indeed the villain who have killed so many of my kinsmen? Then, indeed, I will tear thee to pieces with my teeth, suck thy blood, and grind thy bones to powder. You'll have to catch me first, quoth Jack, laughing. He threw up his coat of darkness and put on his slippers of swiftness. He then began to nimbly lead the giant to pretty dance, he leaping and doubling light as a feather the monster following heavily like a walking tower, so that the very foundations of the earth seemed to shake at every step. At this game the onlookers nearly split their sides with laughter, until Jack, judging there had been enough of it, made for the drawbridge, ran neatly over the single plank, and reaching the other side, waited in a teasing fashion for his adversary. On came the giant at full speed, foaming at the mouth with rage, and flourishing his club. But when he came to the middle of the bridge, his great weight, of course, broke the plank, and there he was fallen headlong into the moat, rolling and wallowing like a whale, plunging from place to place, yet unable to get out and be revenged. The spectators greeted his efforts with roars of laughter, and Jack himself was at first too overcome with merriment to do more than scoff. At last, however, he went for a rope, cast it over the giant's two heads, and, with the help of a team of horses, drew them shorewards, where two blows from the sword of strength settled the matter. After some time spent in mirth and pastimes, Jack began once more to grow restless, and taking leave of his companions, set out for fresh adventures. He traveled far and fast, through woods and vales, until at last he came, late at night, upon a loathsome house set at the foot of a high mountain. Knocking at the door, it was opened by an old man whose head was as white as snow. Father, said Jack, ever courteous, can you lodge a benighted traveler? Ah, that I will. Welcome to my cottage, replied the old man. Whereupon Jack came in, and after supper they sat together, chatting in a friendly fashion. Then it was that the old man, seeing by Jack's belt that he was the famous giant killer, spoke in the wise. My son, you are the greatest conqueror of evil monsters. Now close by there lives one well worthy of your prowess. On the top of yonder high hill is an enchanted castle kept by a giant named Galigantua, who, by the help of a wicked old magician, traps many beautiful ladies and valiant knights into the castle, where they are transformed into all sorts of birds and beasts, yea, even fishes and insects. There they live pitiably in confinement, but most of all do I grieve for a duke's daughter, 
whom they kidnapped in her father's garden, bringing her hither in a burning chariot, drawn by fiery dragons. Her form is like that of a white hind, and though many valiant knights have tried their utmost to break the spell and work her deliverance, none have succeeded. For, you see, at the entrance to the castle are two dreadful griffins who destroy everyone who attempts to pass them. Now Jack bethought of him in the coat of darkness, which served him so well before, and he put on the cap of knowledge, and in an instant he knew what had to be done. Then the very next morning, at dawn time, Jack arose and put on his invisible coat and his slippers of swiftness, and in the twinkling of an eye he was on the top of the mountain, and there were the two griffins guarding the castle gates. Horrible creatures with forked tongues and tails. They did not see him because of the coat of darkness, so he passed by, unharmed. Hung on the doors of the gateway, he found a golden trumpet on a silver chain, and beneath it was engraved in red lettering. Whoever shall this trumpet blow will cause the giant's overthrow. The black enchantment he will break, and gladness out of sadness make. No sooner had Jack read these words when he put the horn to his lips and blew aloud, Tend to be, tend to be, tend to be. Now at the very first note, the castle trembled to its vast foundations. And before he had finished the measure, both the giant and the magician were biting their thumbs and tearing their hair, knowing that their wickedness must now come to an end. But the giant showed fight and took up his club to defend himself. Whereupon Jack, with one clean cut of the sword, severed his head from his body and would doubtless have done the same to the magician, but that the latter was a coward and calling him a whirlwind was swept away by it into the air, nor has he ever been seen or heard of since. The enchantments being thus broken, all the valiant knights and beautiful ladies who had been transformed into birds and beasts and fish and reptiles and insects returned to their proper shapes, including the duke's daughter, who, from being a white hind, showed as the most beauteous maiden upon whom the sun had ever shone. Now, no sooner had this occurred than the entire castle vanished away in a cloud of smoke, and from that moment, giants vanished also from the land. So Jack, when he had presented the head of Galagantua to King Arthur, together with all the lords and ladies he had delivered from enchantment, found he had nothing more to do. As a reward for past services, however, King Arthur bestowed the hand of the Duke's daughter upon honest Jack, the giant killer. So married they were, and the entire kingdom was filled with joy at their wedding. Furthermore, the king bestowed on Jack a noble castle with a magnificent estate belonging thereto, whereon he, his lady, and their children lived in great joy and contentment for the rest of their days. And this, my darling, ends our story time for today. As always, I hope that you have very sweet and creepy dreams.